uh, next up is Heinz, who's going to talk a little bit about um, parallelization and, and explain this code, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. So thanks very much for coming. I have uh, spoken at lots of different conferences, but I've never been as intimidated as this place, especially after Derek's introduction this morning. I mean, you, you guys invented the internet, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, after that, what am I going to say? Right? <laughs> All right, so we're going to look at how to improve CPU utilization using fork join and also the managed blocker. And this is what the CPUs looked like on my little machine here before I used the managed blocker. And after I used the managed blocker, it looked like this. Now, there's some differences, first of all. Um, at the beginning, um, the, the real cores, it's a four core machine with hyper threading, so it's four real cores. The four cores um, has a fair amount of black at the beginning of the run. Right? So it's not fully utilizing the CPU. And once I've used the managed blocker, the black goes mostly away, so it's mostly green at the beginning. And this gives you a, um, a, about an 8% improvement in the performance of this particular calculation. And what I'm going to do today is to show you how to do this. Now, there's a lot of coding that I'm going to be doing, and uh, I tend to make mistakes when I do coding in front of a live audience, and also without live audience, but then they don't know about that. So I get away with it if nobody's watching. So please pay attention, and if you see me make a mistake, please help me to correct it, because otherwise the experiment's not going to work at all. Uh, what I'm also going to do after each step, I'm going to commit the change so that you can, at the end of the, of the talk, look at all of the changes and go through it again, because we will go through this quite quickly. There's not that much time to code all this stuff. We're going to look at a very famous uh, number series by Leonardo of Pisa, called Fibonacci, most commonly. And uh, it works like this, f of naught is naught, f of one is one, and f of n is the two previous numbers added together. And so the next number is always the previous numbers, and the numbers get large very quickly, as you can uh, see in Australia when they had this big problem with the rabbits breeding uncontrollably. Now, if you take a naive implementation, um, f of naught is naught, f of one is one, and then so if, an, if n is less or equal to one, we return n, otherwise we return f of n minus one plus f of n minus two, it's a very bad algorithm, right? It's basically the complexity in, is in itself a Fibonacci series. So it gets slow incredibly quickly. And I tried to do an estimate of how long would it take to work at Fibonacci 1000, and sort of the closest I could get to was not 14 billion years, but 10 to the power of 200 years, right? That's the Fibonacci 1000 with this algorithm. So basically, it's intractable. You can't actually solve that. And Interestingly, you will find this algorithm exactly like this in the JDK. And you'll find it written just like this in a performance book that I won't name. Java Performance Book. It's not called Java Performance Tuning. It's another book. So, um, we could use iteration, which goes like this, naught to n, um, work out the next value based only on the previous two values, and with this, you could work out for actually 1 billion in a much shorter time, but the number overflows pretty quickly, around about for 70 or so, it's overflown. And so, um, even though the complexity is, is good, you'd have to use big integer, and big integer, the add, is also linear, in a quadratic um, complexity. And so, for actually 1 billion would take, again, a very, very long time to solve. So the third one is a slightly better approach, where we are, first of all, improving the algorithm to use a more intelligent algorithm. And in this case, we're using Dijkstra's sum of squares. And uh, it's got logarithmic time complexity, so that's, of course, much better. And the multiply in Java 8 has also improved a lot from previous versions. In previous versions, multiply was quadratic, whereas now it's got either n to the power of 1.585 or n to the power of 1.465, which makes a huge difference. We see the graphs, you'll see that it, it's uh, much, much faster. And um, the numbers that we only care about are the big numbers. And so the only one that we really care about is, is the Tomb-Cook Tomb calculation. At the moment, it's still single-threaded, but we will make it multi-threaded and do it parallel as well. So this is the first experiment we're going to take the algorithm at, as it stands at the moment, which is the very old, the, the very basic implementation, 
and we're going to rewrite it using the sum of squares. So it's basically if, if n is an odd number, then it's the half of n squared plus n minus 1, half of n minus 1, minus 1 squared. And if it's even, it's this other calculation. So let's do this quickly. Let's go to IntelliJ, which I also use. I've been using for a long time. And um, here's a Fibonacci. This is the old code. And now I'm going to say the half of n is going to be n plus 1 divided by 2. And then we're going to say a big integer f naught equals f of half minus 1. And f of 1 will be half. And uh, then we're going to say if n percentage 2 is 1, I know you could use bit masking, but it's actually exactly the same code because it's a uh, power of 2, so it doesn't matter. Um, so we're going to say return f of naught dot multiply f of naught, that's f of naught naught squared. There is actually a square function inside big integer, but it's private, so we can't call it from outside. We'll see that in a moment. And then we say dot add f of 1 dot multiply of f of 1. Right. Um, else, we're going to say return f of naught. We're going to, want to multiply by 2. This time we will use a bit shift by 1. Dot add of f of 1 and multiply that with f of 1. And that should give us the correct answer if I've done this correctly, which is quite unlikely, but we'll try it anyway. So let's run this. And um, I'm not using CMS. I'm using parallel GC. Sorry, I know that was a stupid joke. So there we go. So it's running for a while, and um, we, we want to get some figures as to how long it takes to calculate this, this number. And I'm, I'm working out Fibonacci 100 million, so it's a, it's a sizable number. It's like in the tens of megabytes of one single number. And once we finish that, we're going to um, see if we can make it run faster. So it's happily chugging along. And... Um, and, 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 soon, soon to be finished, hopefully. 44 seconds, 43.945 seconds, of, so 44 seconds. And this is a CPU graph, and you can see that we actually were running basically single-threaded. Um, not completely single-threaded, because sometimes the GC was running, and the GC is running on all eight cores. But besides the GC, it's running single-threaded. So, um, what we can do, uh, before I do anything, let me just quickly commit that, so we can get commit minus A, demo one. And I'll, I'll keep on doing this, and then, and then you can see the whole history of what I've coded. Now, um, what we've done is we've implemented this algorithm, and we could actually solve very large numbers. Now, it took a while, and we didn't use all the available CPU, but we could work out big numbers. Let's take demo two, where we're going to parallelize the algorithm itself. And we do this with a very useful framework called fork join. It gives us recursive decomposition, or divide and conquer. And what I'm doing here is I'm constructing a recursive task, which is a wrapper for the code that must be run in parallel. And um, then I'm forking that. And after that, I'm, I'm working out f of half. And after that, I'm joining the first calculation again. So I'm just basically doing them in parallel, or potentially in parallel. They don't necessarily have to run in parallel, but potentially they can run in parallel. Let's try that out. Um, so here we're going to say, um, we're going to make a recursive task of f naught. So it's going to be a fork join task, returning a big integer. So it's going to be f naught task equals new recursive task. and um, all we do is we take the code that's down here and we're going to copy and paste it into there. We then say if not task.fork. I often forget that, and then it doesn't work. And after we've worked out f of 1, we can then say if of uh, if one, uh, so if not task.join. So this way we can use all eight cores to work out the number. Now, before we did it in 44 seconds, I've got four real hardware cores on here. How fast do you think I can calculate it now? From 44 down to? Anybody want to guess? 30. Pardon? 30. 
30? You're a pessimist. Okay, some overhead, right? Divided by number of cores plus some overhead. So, any guesses? 12, 13? Okay, we got the optimist 12 down to the pessimist 30. Let's try it out and run it. And um, we're going to this time, from the beginning, look at what the CPU is doing. And you can see that the CPU is much more busy. See, there, we are using all the CPUs. This is much better. Okay? Oh, not anymore. Hmm. So we start off great. We start off with the optimist and we end up with the pessimist. Right? And the real answer is somewhere in between the pessimist or the pessimist and the optimist. Okay. So we can see that we actually ran it in 22 seconds. So the first one was 44 seconds, 22 seconds. It's actually normally a bit worse than twice as fast. Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of closer to your, your answer normally than, than your answer. And you can see that in the beginning it's really busy, and then it's, the CPUs slow down. They become less active. All right, so, um, and if you do a profile on that, you'll see that the, the reason why is because once we start calculating, we, we start having to multiply very large numbers. And the multiply is single-threaded. So the, the, final few, the final few numbers are going to only use a very few number of cores in here. And that's why we're not getting the, the four times speed up that we were hoping to get. All right, so um, before we could do anything, let me quickly commit that again. Demo two. And, and now, and, but besides, but by the way, if you want to ask questions, you can at any time ask questions. So please don't let, let, this, let this stop you. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just comment out some of the tests because I don't want to get distracted by any of them. The only one I care about is test 100 million. And... Um, the other ones don't matter. So, let's go and, and do something else, which is we can go and, uh, what I've done is I've, I've, I've got another version of the big integer. I just basically copied and pasted the whole math packet into my own package. And I'm going to parallelize this as well. So I'm going to basically take fork join and stick it in there. It's a different license, actually. That's why it's in two different modules. This one is, um, is the normal... GNU license. So, um, what we're looking for is square tomb cook and multiply tomb cook. And uh, within square tomb cook, what they do is they take the number and they, they break it up into five equal chunks. Then they do some maths wizardry, which I don't understand. Um, and then in the end, they, they join it together and they have the number, the square. Um, and so, what we're going to do is we're going to basically fork this one and then join it over there. So in other words, fork the, fork the first square, do some calculations, and then join after we've finished with the second square. And then we're going to fork this one and do, do the other calculations, and then join again. Now, we don't want to have too many forks happening at the same time. Um, so that's why I'm forking, and then I'm joining again before I do the next fork. Otherwise, you can have a very large number of threads being constructed within the fork join pool. All right. Now, to do this, I need a recursive task. And I'm going to, this time, be a bit more studious. And I'm going to construct a private uh, static class uh, square, square task, um, extends recursive task of big integer. And in the compute function, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, I'll have to pass in private final static, no, private final big integer A. That's what we are uh, squaring. Return A dot square. Right? As I told you, the square is a private function that you can find within big integer. So this is my square task. I'm going to have a very similar task for multiply. Um, multiply task, except it's going to be A and B. And again, we're going to have a constructor with A and B, and we're going to say A dot multiply with B. All right, so these are my square task and multiply task. And inside my square function, square, I'm, I'm only doing square tomb cook because that's for the very large numbers, and that's what I really care about. I don't care about small numbers. 
And now, over here where I said fork, I'm going to say my square task, v0 task equals new square task, a0. And then we're going to say v0 task dot fork. And later on where I said join, I'm going to join that back again. So let's be, be here, v0 task dot join. It's important that you always fork and then join, of course. And uh, I often forget that. That's why I keep on reminding myself. Uh, square task v1 task equals new square task of this time it's da1. I have no idea what those things mean. I don't understand this algorithm. Um, but I don't need to because I'm just parallelizing it. And then again, v1 task dot fork. And um, later on, I'm going to join that again. It's going to be uh, v1 task dot join. Okay, so this is, the, this is the square done, and that's all I need to do to parallelize the square calculation. So that's pretty neat. Um, we're going to do the same for multiplier to cook. Well, I can't spell multiply to cook. So here I've again got five different slices. A multiplier, so we're going to say multiply task v0 task equals the multiplier task of a0 comma b0 and v0 task dot fork to make sure that that's also forked. Um, and then after I've done the other multiplier, which is over here, and I've, I'll let it do some more calculations, then I'll do the join. Hopefully it's going to be done by then. It should be done by then. So it's going to be v0 equals v0 task dot join. Okay. Now we're going to do the same thing for v1. Um, probably just do a copy and paste here. So v1 task is da1 and db1. Again, don't forget to fork, otherwise it's not going to work. And, uh, then, and I'm going to actually do two multipliers, um, and then I'm going to do uh, v1 task dot join. Now, if I did that correctly, which is extremely unlikely, then it's going to run faster, maybe, perhaps. But of course, you won't agree with that one. But maybe it will run faster if I did it correctly, if it runs at all. Um, okay, so the test passed, which is a good sign. And um, we can see that our CPUs are also more engaged. Well, not actually because I didn't use the, that my doctored big integer. I used Java math big integer. So this is one thing which I need to still do. Um, I need to go back and change it to use my own version of big integer. So let's do that. Let's go back, no, not here, go to Fibonacci. And here we've got Java math. I'm going to take that out. I'm going to instead use import class, the EU Java specialist's performance math big integer, which is the one which is parallelized. Okay, so let's try that again. And hopefully now we'll see that the CPUs keep engaged until the end. Okay, so it's too early to say, but it does look promising that the CPUs are now fully utilized. So that's, that's great. So, so we are we're on the right track. We're now at 17 seconds. We were at, we started at 44 seconds, we got down to 22 seconds, now we're at 17 seconds. So that's, we're on the right track. Um, and the next step is to have a look quickly before we go into the next demo, where we are wasting our time on these calculations and that will give us a hint as to, where, as to what we can look at next. So let's go to Fibonacci again and what I'll do, it's just around here. I'm going to just do a, a time. Um, I need to be careful because I can't. System, time, system current time minutes is a very expensive call. Um, yeah, okay, I'll do that. I don't really want to because I wanted to. Okay, I'll do demo three. And I'll do another commit for the time information. Thanks. So. Time equals, now, I, I, I can't call current time values every single time because it's a very expensive call. I'm only going to do it if n is bigger than 1,000. 
if it's bigger than 1,000, I'm going to use system current time minis. Otherwise, I'll just use naught. Okay? And then um, we'll say here, um, try finally. And in the finally, I'm going to say time equals. And again, um, if n is bigger than 1,000, we take system current time minis. Otherwise, just use naught. Uh, minus time. Otherwise, just use naught. And then um, if time is bigger than, let's say, 20 milliseconds, I'm going to print out um, f of n equals and the time. Obviously, not the real number because it'll take too long, but this will show us where we've got, uh, where we're spending our time. Okay, you might have already picked up something here by looking at the numbers flying past. Anybody spot anything with the numbers? This is true. This is a very good observation. Um, the, that one of them is longer than the other one. And remember, we've got two different calculations, but there's something else that you might observe here. Yes, exactly. We're doing the same work over and over again. All right, so this is another good observation. You can see here, this takes 340 milliseconds, but we're doing it like one, two, three, four times. So, yeah, we're very busy, but we're busy doing the same thing over and over again. So that's kind of silly, right? Um, the, the, even an odd is another very interesting observation, which you can see right at the end quite well, quite strongly. In fact, it's the opposite to what you said. The odd ones are faster than the even ones, right? And the, the reason that they're supposed to be, in fact, here you're right, but the other one you're wrong. <laughs> so the reason is that squares, the square algorithm is faster than the multiply algorithm. So it, it should be faster on, e, on odd numbers than even numbers. But okay. Um, anyway, we got down to, we, we, um, we, we had 17 seconds before. That's no different. Um, and what we want to do next, I'm going to just commit this. Um, demo three with timing. Next, we want to to try and address that particular uh, problem. All right, so I skipped over some things here. Oh, by the way, um, I'll show you this link again later. If you want to get lots of spam, subscribe to my newsletter. You'll get one email a month from me. Um, and also, I'll send you if you want information about the, the source code here. So um, we did this part. Um, cache results. So that's the third. That's the fourth thing we want to do is to cache the results. Um, and the idea is that we, we don't work out the numbers over and over again. We rather just have a cache where we put the values, so we don't have to do the work over and over. But we also have to be careful of a memory leak. So we don't want to have a static mash, a, a static cache. So we're going to construct the cache, fill it with data, and then throw it away at the end of the run. Let's try to do that. So we go back to our code, and um, I'm going to have an, a second method. And uh, this method is going to be, I'm going to pass on a map from integer to big integer cache. And um, here we're going, to, we're going to set up the cache map from integer uh, to big integer cache equals new. We'll have to use concurrent hash map because we've got uh, multiple threads using the map at the same time. How many of you have heard of the new method in Java 8 called compute if absent? Very good, it's uh, up to five. How many of you have used or are using compute if absent? You might want to change your code. <laughs> and, and you know why, right? He knows why. He, he, that told me about a very interesting, uh, it's, it's got two problems. Two big problems. One is an infinite loop, possibly, and the other one is contention, very bad contention on it. So uh, keep your eyes open for that. Cache.put naught comma big integer zero and big integer one. And then we're going to say return f of n comma cache. I'm going to cheat a bit because I'm a bit stupid and I can't find all the right places in the code. So I want to find all the Fs that, that were called F before and I want to put in the cache. So I'm just going to like change the name. 
And that shows me down here where I forgot to put in the cache. Right? So that's uh, Heinz's easy cheating way of finding out where to put the right num numbers, and then I can put it back to F. There we go. So um, now I'm using the cache. Of course, I'm creating I'm not using it yet. I'll use it now in a second. Um, in here, I'm going to say um, where I do the actual uh, over here we do the, when I, okay, so we don't, I don't need this anymore because it'll never be. I can say I can say big integer result equals cache dot get of n, and if result is null, then I can calculate it and I can say result equals and result equals, and at the end of this this block here, I can say. I need to say cache.put in comma the results. So I put it in. And then I'm going to say return the result. So now we're not going to work it out over and over again. We're just going to work it out once. And after that, get it from the cache. You're still going to do over and over again because there's a race condition. Ah, very good observation. Thank you. Well, that's the next step. Yeah. We might see some improvement, but you're absolutely right. We're not going to see a full improvement because we still will, will have sometimes working out the same number. Not as much, and we've gone down to sort of almost 12 seconds, uh, just under 12 seconds. So it has had some benefit, but you're absolutely right. We still are doing it sometimes. And we're still doing here, for example, um, what's it, 25 million twice. And, Two, four, nine, 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 twice, and so on. So there, it's happening still that we're doing multiple, multiple times, but not as much. And we did actually bring the time down. So um, this is again another opportunity to commit that. That's demo four. And uh, next one is to what we're going to do is we, I'm going to put a special value into the map, and the special value is going to say um, that. I'm busy working on it. So instead of, instead of, instead of just uh, you know, having everybody work at the same thing, whoever gets there first is the one who's going to do the calculation. And everybody else is going to wait until the first one is finished. And uh, I call this a reserved caching scheme. It's a, it's a funny name. It's an elaborate practical joke that I started a long time ago. Uh, never mind. The name does actually make sense, I think, when you see what I'm going to code here. Um, okay, so uh, next step is to, what we're going to do is we're going to make a, a reserved object. So it's going to be private, final, big integer, reserved, equals new big integer, oh no, I always get this wrong, big integer dot value of minus 1,000. So I have one instance for each Fibonacci object. And um, then when I, when I run this code, I'm going to, instead of saying get, I'm going to use another method called put if absent in comma reserved. Like that. Okay. In comma reserved. Um, all right. So if result is null, then we were the first. So the, you always get back what was there. And if, if you were the first to put that in, then you're going to get back null. That's what put if absent does. And otherwise, we're going to, it, can, it could also be if result is equal to reserved. That's another option. Um, and if it's equal to reserved, then we're going to say return, uh, we're going to now wait until it's done. So we're going to say over here, synchronized reserved, um, while result equals cache.getN is not equal to reserved, I'm going to say reserved dot wait, which is going to suspend the thread and wait until it's done. And um, if this causes an exception, I'm going to throw a new cancellation exception, interrupted, like that. Um, now I also need to to notify. So I'm going to do that wrapped around here. I'm going to say, uh, sorry, uh, uh, synchronized reserved, and. I'm going to put it in, and we're going to say reserve.notify all. Anybody who waits gets woken up. Now, there's not going to be a lot of contention on this object. You see, there are not that many cases where we're going to have contention. We just want to prevent having multiple, multiple threads 
running on this at the same time, working on the same number at the same time. So, um, if you run this again, um, it doesn't work, which is interesting. It should be equal to sequence. Ha, you guys are amazing, thank you. Uh, by the way, if you, if you want to speak, it's best to press the button, so we can also record your, your comments. Um, thanks for that help. And now we can see that it, it runs correctly, and I uh, should, where's my task manager? I must open the task manager again. Oh, there it is. I've got to just open this again, so you can see it. No, CPU. There we go. Okay. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. There is something I'm not understanding. We are using the same reserve the object for all the calculations. Yes. So what happens if you have two different uh, number for two different uh, two, the same reserved object for two different calculation number and then you have modified all, but one, one is done and the other is Okay, so, so Mario is asking the question of what happens, I'm just repeating because the microphone wasn't on, um, what happens if I've got two threads which are both waiting for different numbers? Um, it can happen, but it's not a highly contentious problem. So, they, so, so they'll both wake up, and the one will say, oh no, it's still not equal to the number, and I'll just go back to sleep. So it's, it's, it's not a correctness problem, and it's, you're also not going to get a big performance improvement by fixing that. So you can, you can address it, you can change it, but it, it's not going to really pay you to change it. Okay, okay? it's a really good question, thanks. Um, and for the same reason, you could also say that, that, that you could have lots of different um, reserved objects. You could say anything which is negative as a reserved object. And I've tried that out to, to see whether it makes an impact, and it really doesn't, because that's not our bottleneck. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, what happens if you use standard big integer? Uh, sorry, yeah? What happens if you use standard big integer? Because right now you're drastically reducing... Oh, that's a good question. Population. Let's try that out. So we now... So what we've done is we've sort of done a whole bunch of different tests and diff different improvements, and the question is, which one is actually making the big difference here? Because we're now down to, um, oh wow, that's a, good, that's a good number, under nine seconds, right? So we've gotten down to under nine seconds, which is uh, phenomenally good. Um, yeah, we, we're wasting less CPU cycles, right? So it's under nine seconds. Now, um, I will answer your question in a moment, but I first want to run this again um, so we can see the CPU usage. And you can see that at the beginning, there's still a time, not very much, but there's a time at the beginning where there's some black, when it's ramping up. At the beginning of the algorithm, there are going to be more cases where you're going to be waiting for others. And then once, once, you, once the numbers get bigger, then it's more going to be a case of the, the big integer parallelization is going to start kicking in and helping you. So remember we are at nine seconds. In fact, it's now just under nine seconds, 8.8 .8 seconds, which is very good. And the last step, which we'll do after I've done a demo for you, is to try and address this last little bit of black, which in this graph is not that much, but in the graph I showed you at the beginning of the, of the talk was a bigger number, and that was more significant. And we actually got an 8% improvement in performance. Now, um, before I do anything, I'm going to do a quick commit. This was demo five. And then we're going to go back and change it to be... Um, the standard uh, big integer. So let's comment out the math, and we'll use the Java math big integer, and we'll run this again. And I've got no idea what the output will be, but I have a suspicion of what we'll see. Okay. So you can see that it's basically running single-threaded. There's not much CPU going on here at all. It's still faster, because we're not doing the same number twice. But there's, we're not utilizing the available hardware. So, so it's, it's like all these steps together that give you the, the final results where we are getting a performance improvement. Um, okay, so you can see in the graph here that, that um, at the beginning it was still 
okay because we, do, we were doing the fork join um, and that was making a difference, but towards the end, the, the real difference comes from parallelizing the big integer. Okay. Um, let me just undo that change. All right, and now comes the last one. And the last one is a very, it's, it's a little thing that was added in Java 7, which not many people have realized or realized when they put it in. Um, there's a class called Phaser in Java 7. Who's heard of the class Phaser? It's like countdown latch, or, yeah, you've probably written it, but <laughs> Phaser, right? Now, Phaser, it's, it's a replacement for countdown latch and, um, and uh, uh, what's the other one? Like countdown latch, the, um, we have threads coming regularly doing something. Not the semaphore, another one like that. I've never, I never use it, so that's why I can't remember the name. Anyway, so phaser is the only class in Java which, which is actually compatible with fork join. You see, when, when, you, start a fork, when you start a fork join job, um, it actually runs with, with as many threads as you've got hardware threads in your system by default. And if you have one thread which gets blocked up um, because it's waiting for something, like what we're doing now, then, then, then in the meantime, we've got, the, 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 we've got less threads which are working in the system actively doing something. Now, what the managed blocker does is, is it tries to keep the, the fork join pool at the desired parallelism. When you construct the fork join pool, you specify how many threads you want to be running at the same time. You don't specify the maximum number of threads, you can't. You only specify how many threads you want to have active at once your desired parallelism. And um, so what the managed blocker does is it automatically starts new threads as you need them. And what we'll do is we'll run this again, and this time we'll do a thread dump, and we'll see that there'll be some threads which are, which are blocked up whilst we're doing our test. Um, and then we'll run it with, with managed blocker, and you'll see that new threads are constructed to take the work of, um, to, to keep the, the parallelism high. So let's run this test once more, and this time we'll do a, a thread dump whilst we're doing it. Um, I'll, in fact, I'll do a few thread dumps. So it's got this lovely camera icon. Click. Another thread dump. I've got to be quick now because it's so fast. Um, and, uh, all right, so we've got a few thread dumps. Let's um, put this into a, an editor. I'm surprised you didn't mention VI on your, on your slides. Okay. And uh, what we're looking for now is, is workers. And they, here's a worker, for example, um, the common pool worker. Actually, the main thread is also going to be a worker doing work. And you can see here now there's runnable, there's also here there's object wait, right? So you've got thread five is waiting, thread Three is waiting, two and one is waiting, so they're all waiting. And you've got eight threads, including the main thread, um, but the worker thread, some of them are actually doing work, other, one are, other ones are just waiting. Towards the end, I don't think it's such a problem, like the last one, the last thread dump, you've got runnable, 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 runnable. So this is a problem in this algorithm at the beginning of the algorithm where some are waiting for other results to be completed before they can continue. Um, towards the end, you're doing just number crunching, and it's, it's over. Um, and so what we want to do is to address that, to, get, to squeeze the last bit of performance out, um, is, to, is to solve this problem. So the way that you do it is you construct a class called a managed blocker. So this is now a private... Um, class called, let's call it the reserve blocker, reserved blocker, uh, extends, implements, sorry, the managed blocker, and as I said, the only one, only class that actually does that at the moment is phaser. There were talks of using, of also making the abstract queued synchronizer implement managed blocker, but they never did that. Um, what I did in one of my newsletters, I, I made the um, reentrant lock implement managed blocker, and then I hacked those, those modified reentrant locks into, into, blocking, into array blocking queue, link blocking queue, 
And that way, they also became compatible with, with the fork join framework. So here, I'm going to um, implement two methods. It's the uh, block method and is releasable. Now, um, in the code down here where I'm waiting, I've got three components to this, to this code. The first component is the condition predicate. The condition predicate tells me how long I need to wait before I can exit from this loop. The second component is the actual lock that I'm locking on. And the third component is the condition Q. Now, because I'm using synchronized, condition Q and the lock are the same thing. But the condition predicate is something separate. And this over here is basically your condition predicate. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to copy that into my condition predicate, which is, the, is, is a method called isReleasable. So I'll make a comment here. This is basically your condition predicate. And we're going to say return that it's not equal to reserved, right? Um, so we want to return whether or not we need to block. So if it returns true, we don't need to block. It's releasable. If it's not true, we need to block and wait until it's, until it's, um, it's available. Now, um, I need to create fields for this. So result I need a field for. And that's going to be a big integer result. Oh, before doing it. Yeah, okay, now let's just check I'm using the right big integer. And then cache, I need a field. Map integer, comma, big integer. And then n, I need a field as well. And um, that's going to be an int. And we'll mark these final, these two. And insert a constructor for those two. And so now I've got a reserved blocker that takes an n and a cache and it returns, well, we're going to use, we're going to, to, make, to, to return a result later on. So um, I'll make this volatile. I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think I need it, but there's no big harm in doing it in this case. Is releasable, it's condition predicate, and then block is going to be very similar to the code that I've got down here. And um, it's going to basically say, while um, not is releasable, reserved dot wait. And then return true means I did get, I, I did do what I wanted to do, and we can exit from here now. Right? We need to return true, otherwise you'll keep on, well, uh, I don't think it's going to, to return from the, from the block. Okay, any questions so far? Microphone, please. Would it be as possible to add a histogram to this waiting? Because I expect that due to the structure of your mathematical formulation, you're going to run, you're running actually on two or three threads maximum. They must be blocking because they're co collapsing on the same number too often. You, you see pikes in the CPU graph because your sampling is too wide yeah. and the threads are jumping around, so they're accumulating information, but you're not sampling uh, with fine granularity enough. So you, I expect your calculation is actually on the order of three, maybe uh, 300, maybe 400 percent at tops. Okay. Um, can you just repeat what the question was? Because I missed it from the beginning. Would it be possible to get the, how many of uh, threads simultaneously yes. waiting on this condition? So how many threads right. are Right. So, so, so we actually saw, um, you could measure like the, the whole run and see how many threads are, running, are, are waiting at one point. We did see at the beginning that there were like three or four which were waiting. But don't forget that I've got eight threads running and I've only got four real cores running, on, uh, four, hardware, four hardware cores. So, uh, so having four waiting is not, not a train smash. But the problem gets, as, as, the, as the number that we're calculating gets bigger, you've got, you've got a higher number of threads in proportion to the available hardware that are waiting at the beginning. We can discuss often. No, no, I, I, we do have time for, for questions, so, so please, if, if I didn't answer that. Uh, that's a bit long, actually. I thought it's not easy to implement. We can really discuss it later. <laughs> you can continue. Okay. Um, so let's, let's continue with the code. This is, a, this is how they do a reserve blocker. Um, and I would apply it in here, um, where I've got the synchronized reserved. Um, I would now take this out. 
doesn't take too much out. And I would say mana, uh, reserved blocker equals new reserved blocker, passing in the, the parameters, n and the cache. And then I'd say fork join pool dot manage block, the blocker. This will wait until it's finished before returning. And then I'm going to say um, results equals blocker dot, I get the result from there. Now this, this last step I often forgets and then it doesn't work, but this, this should now work correctly. So now the managed blocker, the managed block will sometimes create more threats to keep the parallelism at the same level. Um, let's run this now. And um, with this small number, you don't actually see such a big, ah, what have I done now? Dum, 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 dum. Oh, right. I have somewhere waited without synchronizing. There we go. Need to synchronize there. Reserved. Let's try that again. And we'll have a look at the CPUs in a moment, at the threads, uh, what the CPUs are doing. It, is, it was a little bit faster. You see that it was at 8.5 seconds. Not a lot. Um, and the reason is the, the, the part which we were trying to save, we, we need to look at the real cores here. It's this one, this one, this one, and this one. So the 0, 2, 4, and 6. The ones in between, that's your hyper-threaded. We don't really care too much about those. If those are 100% or not, it's not so important. But these ones, you can see that they are pretty much at the top all along. So, we, so that little bit that we saved here with this, with this big calculation does work out to a much bigger percentage, of course, when you have a bigger number. And we, we actually also did run a bit, bit faster. It wasn't a huge difference, but it does make a small difference. Um, of course, the biggest difference we had was from the algorithm change, and we always have that with all our systems. That the biggest win is that. Now, let me quickly um, commit that, lest I get in trouble. And, oh, okay. Um, let's do this. So this is in the present branch. So that should be up there. And um, Let's go back to our presentation. So I want to show one more thing before I put up the final question slide, and that is I want to do some thread dumps while running this, this new code. So one, two, three, four. Okay, so I've got four thread dumps, that should be enough. And if I now open these, oh, no, that's the wrong one, um, let's grab the output. And I search for worker thread. You'll see that I've all of a sudden got a worker 14 in the first bit. So I've got worker 14 who's, who's runnable. Um, and I've got a few workers which are, which are waiting. Um, and then the f worker 14 is still around. Still around. Um, and so it, it, it will try and have seven workers plus the main thread that do the actual calculations. And if you run it a few times, you'll find more workers or less workers. Um, but there are all of a sudden new threads which are arriving to keep the parallelism at the same level within the fork joint pool. So we've had a whole bunch of questions during the talk. We've come to the end. Um, are there any further questions? And this is the link if you want to get the source code, um, the, the project, uh, and also subscribe to the newsletter. And if you want other stuff, it's all there. Lots of spam every day in your email. Once a month, actually. Um, any questions? Uh, please put the microphone on so we can record it. There's a button that you press. Yeah. Um, could you achieve the same results by using um, fork, fork uh, task in the map? So you put the fork task in the map? Or right. Wait on that? You mean, you mean like a future task? Uh, yeah, things like that. And so you join on the, on the task on, so that you don't use synchronize and the pool know that you are waiting on a, a task of the pool and it can create new, new thread by it. 
itself without using managed broker? So, so there, there are a bunch of different ways you can do it. Um, it the, you could, the, the thing is that if you... I haven't really thought about doing the fork join into the map like that. I don't think that's going to help you because I've really done the fork join before I get there. Um, and what I'm trying to avoid is to avoid having duplicate work being done. That's what I'm trying to avoid here. Um, so one, one could experiment and see if that's going to help or not, um, but that's not the bottleneck. So when we, when, when, when we you know, the, the next big change is to, again, improve the algorithm, and that's going to help you more than, than do that at that level. Algorithm improvements always help more than parallelization. You know? Hardware is one, only one way to solve a problem. Clever brains helps more. Any other questions? Yes, a microphone, please. Well, it's not really about the threads, but this thing you used in idea when you wrap the code in track edge or whatever, like is it a sh like shortcut, default shortcut to this? Wh which one for that? Like for example, when you select several lines and then you have this uh, context menu to wrap in a... Oh yeah, uh, uh, oh, right. So, so IntelliJ, is, I'm actually to do a course on IntelliJ. Uh, basically, there's like some, sh some shortcuts you can press to, to select more and more code. It's the thing I probably use the most. Um, there's a fun little thing here called the productivity guide. Help. And that shows you what you've done the most, right? <laughs> Where you've actually spent the most uh, time. And, and this, this one thing where I'm selecting um, code, I, I do incredible amount of times. Um, used number of times, like syntax aware selection, I've used like 60,000 times. Right? <laughs> it's really often. <laughs> so if you just know that and you know smart auto completion, um, smart, smart type completion, actually basic code completion, if you know those things, you don't have to really code anymore. Just let the ID do the work for you. So um, again, thanks very much for having me and listening to me so well. And thanks for participation and the great, great questions. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>